Asa by Zeitgeistig Chapter 13 Magnum Opus Part 2 Later that day, Harry and Draco managed to sneak off to Diagon Alley long enough to buy one bottle of rectified spirits and three bottles of pure red wine. The man tanning the till at the off-license gave them a very steady look, as if he knew exactly what they were up to. Harry was quite sure he didn't. They paid and returned to the borough before anyone was the wiser, except for perhaps George, who lifted his eyebrows up on their return. I spent some time being highly visible playing against Mr. Wheezy on the PlayStation, but Mr. Wheezy was much better and there was only so much humiliation one man could take. He put in his time with the jewel ball, he rather thought. Once he was sure no one could say he hadn't been around on Boxing Day, they snatched up Snow's little portrait, Harry's little cauldron, and four bottles of alcohol and slipped out the back door. It was cold and blustery, but there wasn't any snow this year, so they were able to make it to the area behind the shed without leaving tracks. Draco got the cauldron fire going while Harry and Snape flicked through copies of various alchemical texts and personal notes. Salt, sulfur, and mercury are all required for transformation, Snape said, as they represent the path divinity took when it created the world. Have you got each of these? Harry scrunched his nose. Salt of earth, and that's a stone. Sulfur obviously infused in it. Mercury is often represented by aqua vitae, so once we distill the wine, we'll have that. Draco settled the flame and came over to join them. But the salt and the sulfur are from previous steps. With each operation, the meaning changes a little. We have to match it to the effects we're trying to achieve. We want to transmute gold, therefore, we need to represent salt, sulfur, and mercury in ways that will encourage that. Harry chewed his lip. Snape was stuck to the back of the shed with a sicking spell, but had already turned to rummage around in his bookshelf for another reference. Salt is the body, said Harry. The stone has changed with each operation. Oh, I think it's new and relevant to this step. We wanted to be able to transmute gold after the fermentation operation. We've already done that metaphorically with the stone itself. It's gone from common gneiss to pure quartz. Not only that, but pure red quartz. It's precious now. And sulfur? asked Snape. Sulfur is the spirit, said Draco. The spirit we're aiming for with this operation is gold, thus... He reached into his pocket and tossed a galleon to Harry. Gold. Brilliant, said Harry. He set it on their tiny work table next to the stone. And we have the wine for mercury, but we still need to give the gold a reason to change. He shook his head. I don't know how to represent that. What's a catalyst? The opposite of change, said Snape. A stasis spell, perhaps. A stasis spell combined with a forced change, Harry said. Maybe it needs to be transfigured. He thought transfiguration came at the end, though. Into what? said Draco, eyebrows raised. Something common, something worthless, said Harry. Trailed off thinking, but was coming up with nothing. What was worthless? Voldemort, the Tully Cannons, life without Draco. None of which could be distilled in a bloody potion. Money, said Draco suddenly. What? Harry said. That's like the opposite of true. Draco shook his head. No, you're overlooking the most important thing. Money is only as valuable as people let it be. Spiritually, it's worthless. I was wrong about the galleon being the spirit. It's a catalyst. The spirit of the transformation is what's valuable. And that's life. Life with meaning. Oh, I can hardly represent life with meaning any more easily than I can something worthless, Harry said, scowling. It's love, you two idiots, said Snape. 
They jerked their heads at his frame, but he was studiously staring at the book laid out in his desk and refused to meet their gaze. When he finally did look up, his expression was carefully neutral. Like any potion, the alchemical process is personalized for each individualized wizard. The reason it hasn't been made widely available like a standardized pepper-up is because there is no standard process. Its magic is in the transformation, not the product. Oh, said Harry softly. He his brow, feeling wrong-footed. So long, he said. How do I represent love? Snape's mouth flattened. What does it mean to you to love personally, Potter? He bit his lip. Unwillingly, his eyes met Draco's and found Draco looking back at him. He swallowed again. There was nothing for it. It means Draco. Draco made a tiny, vulnerable sound. Then you must put something of Draco's essence in the potion. Sam did not sound overly surprised. Like Polyjuice? Harry said, still staring at Draco. He'd been unable to look away, in fact. Oh, I need your hair. Rightlessly, Draco reached up and plucked out a single hair. He handed it to Harry. Finally, Harry broke eye contact to turn and arrange everything in the cauldron. It was hot enough now that he could add the wine and did so. All three bottles of it went in, followed by the one of rectified spirits, then the stone, and then the galleon, representing worthlessness, followed. Finally, he added one cup of dried sacred herbs, including mistletoe from the Wheezy's kitchen door, to encourage the putrefaction process. They watched silently as the wine heated up and began to decay the coin, fermenting it and the herbs like it had once been fermented itself. Even with the frigid, cold December air, the heat of the cauldron and Harry's embarrassment kept him from shivering. It must have been half an hour before the herbs were completely decayed and blended in with the melted galleon. It smelled like rot and petrichor and reminded Harry of being in the forbidden forest with Draco and seeing him alive. And through the whole time, not one of them said a word. The potion turned dark and sludgy, with a bubbling milky-white center that moved and undulated as if it were alive. It was like looking down a tunnel of white light while dying. I stared at it, blinking hard. Dumbledore, he thought, and train stations, and having any reason to live now that Voldemort was dead. Harry moved to add the final ingredient. The single hair that represented Harry's love, what made life worth living, what turned into gold. Draco grabbed his wrist before he could drop it in. Wait! His breath hitched. Was he not going to let Harry use his hair after all? What? Draco bit his lip with his right canine tooth. It needs one of your hairs, too. Why? Draco looked away. Because if it's going to work for me too, it has to represent my love as well. I, said Harry. They looked at each other, and it was another full thirty seconds before Harry realized what Draco meant. His heart jumped into his throat and pounded furiously. What? Draco didn't reply, just reached up with his free hand and plucked one of Harry's hairs. He held it out over the cauldron next to the one of his own that Harry held. Ready? he asked. Harry nodded mutely, as one that let the house drop into the potion. He sank to the bottom and disappeared beneath the thick wine and detritus. You need to cover the cauldron now, said Snape. The first six operations are pairs, as you've no doubt seen. Separation and recombination each time. Now you must distill the mixture until all volatile essences are released and purified. Harry nodded. So, boil and condense again and again. Capture the vapors, Draco suggested. When they precipitate, they may be necessary to the elixir. Harry nodded again. 
He rummaged in his kit for his alembic and then attached it to the top of his cauldron. Once secure, he raised the flame again. They settled down on the dead grass, leaning against the shed wall beneath Snape's stuck frame. Somehow their shoulders came to touch, and neither of them moved away. It was warm and quiet in their little area, and there was something profound in watching his hair melt into Draco's. In twenty minutes, the first round of distillation had completed. Harry separated out the impurities, then emptied the alembic back into the cauldron to start the process again. He sat back down next to Draco. The backs of their hands were touching. Harry closed his eyes and focused on the feeling. Half an hour later, the second round of distillation was too completed. This time the solution was even more concentrated than before. Again, he separated out the sludgy impurities and emptied the purified, condensed vapors back into the cauldron. He could see through the liquid now. The stone sat at the bottom, blood-red and vibrant, even in the murky solution. It's making the mother stone, Snape said hoarsely. When Harry transferred the impurities for a third time. Oh, I know, Harry said, almost numbly. It was really working, and he had no idea how it'd come to deserve this, or when it'd become good enough to do it all. When he approached Draco with the idea of working on alchemy together, he'd never really thought they'd succeeded. He never thought they'd even get to the first operation. It was, he could admit, just a desperate measure used to spend time with him. But it was something different now. There was an alchemy in them too, somewhere. Harry settled in for another round of distillation. It was close. So close. It might be the final round, he reckoned. This time, when he sat down next to Draco, Draco's hands slid into his and their fingers interlaced. Harry's breath hitched. He said nothing, and they watched the steam rising through the still and condensing at the top. Their ascents were mingled together somewhere in that steam, and Harry didn't know how to handle that. He was currently blocking out everything that had been said today, on account that he didn't think he would be able to get through this process if he didn't. The fourth time was indeed the last one. The liquid condensed at the top of the alembic was purer, even than distilled water, and a thousand times more precious. Harry separated the shimmering gold wine sludge of impurities from the crystal clear pure solution and the blood red stone still sitting at the bottom of the cauldron. Now what? he said. His voice caught somewhere in his throat. Draco stood up and came to look at the work table. There was a large flask of shimmering clear solution, a red stone and a flask of shiny, thick sludge, not unlike dying blood. This is where the transfigurations comes in, Draco said. He swished his wand once, and the sludge turned hard as stone and perfectly spherical. He swished it again, and the clear liquid did the same. Draco said, Distillation. Three stones distilled into their most perfect formulations. He pointed to the first one, elixir that was sparkling and crystal clear. Mercury, the life force. He pointed to the stone, still blood red and strong. Salt, the body. He pointed to the last one, made of reduced wine, spirits and decayed plant matter. And sulfur, the spirit. It's brilliant, Harry whispered. He reached for Draco's hand again and squeezed. Draco finally looked at him. He smiled a little hesitantly. It's a permanent transfiguration. I'm good at those. Most peoples won't last more than a few weeks, but I'm not most people. Harry nodded. He didn't need to be told that. You're brilliant, he added in case there was any doubt. Draco flushed and they were quiet again, staring down at the three perfect stones. There were seven operations in alchemy, and they'd completed six of them. Snape cleared his throat. You can't turn this project into the Board of Governors. They'll wring you dry. 
I looked down at his cauldron and then at Draco, who was watching him silently from the ground. Oh, I know that, too. But what would they turn in for their intersubject project instead? There's no shame in failure, Draco said. We're right about the experience, but we'll show that we failed at the first step instead. Right, said Harry. He took a deep breath. There is only one step left. Coagulation. Draco nodded. He looked up at the sky. It was getting dark, but perhaps... I know what to do. Tell me, said Harry. They're already separated. We recombine them one final time. I've transfigured their molecular formulations. They won't melt now, but they will be receptive to change when heated. When they reach appropriate temperature, you'll need to charm the sulfur one into the salt and then the mercury around the both. I'll transfigure them into a single solid structure with each layer separate but combined. That is highly dangerous, Snape said. The third one will still be highly reactive. It is, in fact, everything reactive from the original mixture condensed into one thing. Alchemy has proved to be very dangerous undertaking, Harry said, shrugging. Draco pursed his lip. We'll take precautions. Snape rolled his eyes. Gryffindors and Slytherins? Merlin help us all. Harry slipped on his dragonhide gloves and placed all three stones back in his gnice cauldron. Draco raised a number of fierce wards. Once they were both satisfied that things were as safe as they could possibly be, Harry lit the fire again. At first, nothing happened. It wasn't until the flame turned blue hot that the explosion occurred. It rushed outwards and slammed into the wards like a bright wall of fire and reaction. The wards were acutely outlined by fire pressing at them on all sides, pushing steadily outwards with no sign of retracting. They both stepped backwards, pressing their backs against the shed. Snape was yelling something that Harry couldn't understand over the sudden certainty that these wards were not going to hold. He took Draco's hand and Snape's portrait and started running towards the field, but they only made it a few steps before you heard the deafening roar of the wards breaking and felt the heat of the explosion rushing over his skin. Harry was thrown to the ground, hard. He skidded several feet and heard his shoulder crunch somewhere along the way. Vision darkened and he felt dizzy. But Draco landed on top of him, gasping for breath, and he forced himself not to black out. It was just a dislocated shoulder, nothing to worry about. He struggled to his feet, trying to drag Draco with him, but then the second explosion went off, and with it came a rush of sickly wet vapours. He breathed in and immediately knew the error of it. They'd never counteracted a diseased part of the stone to make it panacea, and they were breathing instant death. Draco's face was turning purple and he was gasping in the most horrifying way, as if his lungs were closed off and his throat was full of water. God, he was asphyxiating, right in front of Harry's eyes. Harry had never known terror like this before. Fiendfire didn't even come close. Voldemort didn't even come close. Draco! Harry choked out. He could barely breathe himself, but he had to get Draco out of there. Had to fix him. Why weren't the vapors affecting him as badly? Why wasn't Snape still talking? Why hadn't anyone come out to see what the explosion was? Oh God, the Weasleys! If they came outside and breathed her. Draco's eyes searched him out desperately. His hands were clawing at his throat. Harry grabbed hold of him beneath his arms and pulled hard, as hard as he could, away from the infected air. He barely noticed the agony of his own dislocated shoulder. Draco's lips were blue. He was desperately forming words, but Harry couldn't hear him. He shook his head and belatedly realized that he was crying and his face was soaked. Don't, Harry said, and then cared that it came out as a sub. I'm going to save you. Just be still. Don't use oxygen. 
Draco pressed his lips together tightly, and Harry dragged him, but they were a long way away from the edge of the diseased area, and then Draco's eyes dulled, and he started to twitch, and... No! Harry screamed. He heard the back of the bow slamming open, and dozens of feet pounding out. A oh god! He couldn't let all the Weasleys run into this air! Choking, he slashed his hand furiously around himself and destroyed every last molecule of the diseased vapors. He could barely see through all the stupid tears in his eyes, and Drake was still twitching, and he could not lose him like this. He could not lose him at all. He heard an agonized, keening sound and distantly understood that it came from him. Drake was his love, and he'd sort of said he loved Harry too. There would never be anyone, anyone like him again. And Harry choked again, and it came out as a sob. He fell down next to Draco and pressed his ears to his mouth. God, he wasn't breathing. Harry lifted Draco's chin and then pressed his combined fists down into his sternum, humming brokenly. His heartbeat was non-existent. He could barely remember the song he was supposed to use to keep count, but it didn't matter because it wasn't working. Even when he leant down, closed Draco's nose and breathed everything he had into his lung. Marlin, he was dying, and Harry would never live again. He couldn't. No, no. Harry transformed. He didn't know why precisely, except that he was losing his mind with panic and it had felt necessary. He'd never been so useless in a dangerous situation before. He felt himself come all over Crow, and then he was slammed with a sudden sense of clarity. Crows didn't feel like humans did. They didn't panic like humans did. Harry cocked his head distantly, took in Lavender, sending off a Patronus for a Medi-Wizard, and Hermione rushing forward to take over chest compressions where Harry had left off. She felt her knees right next to him and pressed her mouth over Draco's, and that was good. That was necessary. But something else was necessary too, and only Harry could do that part. He looked around. When he saw Draco, he nearly lost his breath again, but he was a crow now, and they didn't do that sort of thing. Draco stood several feet away, looking on at the scene with groggy confusion. He was blue and clear, like the beetles and runespores and thestrals that had once been so attracted to him. He fluttered over, landed on his shoulder and dug his talons in heart. Draco finally seemed to take notice of him. Harry, he said drowsily. He looked drunk, disoriented. Even in spirit form, his lips were blue, and Harry hated it. So he flapped his wings and pulled with his claws, still digging into Draco's barely their flesh. Draco resisted at first, but Harry was a collector of the dead, and he'd be damned if Draco's sodding Malfoy escaped him. He caught furiously, and Draco scrunched his nose, but did stumble along a few steps when Harry tried to take off again with him still attached. Touch! Harry wanted to scream at him. Oh, touch your body again before you die! He looked into Draco's eyes and tried to will the command into his head like some sort of desperate backwards version of legalimency. Draco blinked quickly and seemed to become slightly more coherent. Harry! he said again. He reached up and stroked his fingers down Harry's feathered back. Harry pulled him closer to his body. Money was crying all over Draco's face as she breathed into his mouth, and she hadn't even cried over her parents. Not until she'd nearly got them back again, anyway. Come, Harry thought at him. Draco looked down at his body. I'm dying. Not yet, Harry thought. Go back, go back, go back. He pecked him sharply, and finally, finally, Draco seemed to understand. He took a few more steps forward and kneeled down next to himself. 
watching Hermione perform CPR with a macabre sort of curiosity. He still hadn't touched, though. Neri had just about had enough of this. He took off from Draco's shoulder and flew several dozen meters up in the air. Then he turned and swooped down as fast as he could, like when he was doing a Ronsky feint, and at the last minute turned his body and let it slam into Draco's half their back. The force of the impact knocked him forward and his translucent spirit sprawled onto his physical body and sunk inside it. Harry tumbled to the ground, his other shoulder dislocated now too. His vision began to darken and he forced himself to transform using the pain of change while injured to keep him conscious long enough to make sure. Next to him, Draco gasped for air. Hermione sobbed in relief, and Harry passed out. It was New Year's Eve when Draco woke up. He and Narcissa had kept a constant vigil over his bed and Bill's old room the whole time. He was downstairs now, having tea with Mrs. Weasley, and Harry was staring out the window, counting constellations and remembering that one night when Draco's touch had changed the meaning of the number 88 for him. On the bedside table, Snape's repaired portrait sat empty. He was no doubt back with McGonagall again, discussing the danger of allowing apprentices to attempt alchemy for intersubject projects. It felt weird having Snape on his side, even if Snape's way of being on Harry's side was it to roll his eyes, tell McGonagall that Harry was entirely too stupid to ever successfully manage even a fraction of the alchemical process, and this was proof that he'd never come close. Harry tossed the philosopher's stone back and forth between his hands. It reflected bright red against the walls. Severe and Crookshanks were jumping around after it, and it almost made Harry smile. He just hadn't smiled too much in the past five days, and the expression felt uncomfortable now. He rolled his shoulder. Now then, fuck, but they still hurt, even after the messy wizard had yanked them back into place. It probably would have helped if he'd bothered to take the pain potions he was then provided with. They sat untouched on Draco's bedside table. He was attuned to the rhythm of Draco's breathing now. He thought he'd always be aware of it on some level. It was the most comforting sound in the world and it kept him calm every day as he sat up here and stared at the walls and windows, waiting. It was because of this that he knew right away when there was a change in it. He looked down at the bed. Draco was looking back at him. His eyes were tired, but they were grey and alive and mercurial, and that was all that Harry needed. Eh, hey. said Draco. He felt his eyes begin to burn again, and he had no idea why, because Draco was awake, and that was good. Eh, hey, he said. He was confused by the raw sound of his voice. Maybe he was just confused by his voice full stop. He couldn't remember speaking a word since Boxing Day. He reached out to take Draco's hand in his, which was trembling for some reason. Harry had no idea what to say to him, so he squeezed his hand and turned back to the window. It was something after ten now. The new year was only hours away. That's Draco, said Draco. His voice was scratchy, as if he'd been strangled. Harry winced. You can see its tail just there, between Ozamaya and Mina. It's a circumpolar constellation. It never goes away, but it's never very noticeable. It's subtle. You're noticeable. Harry said, swallowing. Your absence would have been more so. He turned back to look at Draco and was almost painful to see his face. He'd been so sure, so agonizingly sure that he'd lost Draco. He'd take a thousand dislocated shoulders to make sure it never happened again. Harry set the philosopher's stone on the bedside table and Draco's eyes followed the movement. Draco smirked. Well, brilliant. We're stupid as fuck, Harry corrected. He squeezed Draco's hand as hard as he could, and Draco squeezed back, eyebrows lifted wryly. The door opened then and Narcissa returned with tea for Harry, which she dropped on the floor of Bill's room when she saw that Draco was awake. He let out a little sob and rushed to his side, 
bringing her body on top of his. Draco's breath rushed out in a huff and Harry's insides clenched at the sound. He snatched up the blood-red stone and set it back into his pocket before she or anyone else could see. Draco! Narcissa sobbed over and over. The sound alerted the rest of the household and suddenly there were a dozen or more people crowding into the tiny room. Millicent and Hermione were first to arrive and then Ron and Lavender, Ginny and Luna were called down the stairs that he was awake. Harry heard Mrs. Weasley yelling something through the flue and then McGonagall was rushing up the stairs and Snape was back in his frame and it was, in short, a clusterfuck of Weasleys et al. Draco looked extremely discomfited, especially as he was still half covered by his mother, who would not let go of him any more than Harry would his hand. Mr. Malfoy, said McGonagall, and she seemed on the verge of losing it, or as if she had done very recently. I am pleased that I won't have to interview for a new apprentice. Draco smiled at her from somewhere behind his mother's hair. Me too, headmistress. McGonagall blinked and looked away. She allowed Mrs. Weasley to lead her downstairs for some tea, letting Mr. Weasley, Charlie and Bill come in and say that they were very glad Draco wasn't dead, and that they hoped he wouldn't be too put off by their back garden to not come back for Christmas next year. Though it felt like hours, it wasn't really all that long before most everyone was satisfied that Draco wasn't going to suddenly die and left again for him to get some rest. At 11.30, just Harry and Narcissa remained. They each took a side on his bed and took one of his hand and stared at each other over Draco's reposed body like a silent battle of wills. Harry refused to leave and didn't much care what Narcissa made of it. She cleared her throat. Mr. Potter, she said at last. Harry Bling felt Draco's tendon stiffen beneath his hand. Your experiment nearly killed my son. Harry winced. I know. She stared at him for several more minutes, each one more agonizing than the last. Draco said nothing. Finally she sighed and said, But you saved him, at great personal risk. As I understand it, Severus told me that you remained inside the same lethal fumes with no regard for your own person, trying to get Draco to safety. Correct said Harry, deciding it was best to keep his answers as short and objective as possible. He felt Draco's eyes on his face and refused to blush. He didn't know how much Draco remembered, but in front of his mother was not the time to discuss it. That does not surprise me, said Narcissa. I recall another time when you attempted to throw your own life away. Is this a habit of yours? Harry smiled down at his lap entirely self-deprecatingly. It appears so. She was silent for several more moments, but her voice was harsh when she finally spoke again. Do you intend, therefore, to continue treating something my son holds dear with so little regard? Harry's head snapped up. Sorry, what? She waved her hand frustratedly. Your life, Mr. Potter, my son values it. She glanced pointedly down at her joined hands. Will you continue to try to kill yourself and leave my son unhappy? I will not have it. Harry blinked. What? Harry, honestly, Draco sound. You sound moronic. Don't you know any other words? Harry turned his attention back to the bed. Draco had managed to pull himself up in reclined position and appeared to be watching this exchange with some amusement. I love him. Harry said somewhat stupidly. By the lowering of Narcissa's eyelids, he could tell that she agreed. Obviously, Mr. Potter. She stood, releasing Draco's other hand. But what will you do about it? And then she was gone. The door shut softly behind her. Harry stared at it for several moments, mind curiously blank. It was death, wasn't it? Draco said then. Harry turned his attention to him, and Draco added, Everything in alchemy, I figured it out. When I was suffocating, it came to me and it made me calm. I wasn't sure if I should return to my body because it felt natural, you know. That's only a transmutation of life. 
That's why most wizards can't complete the great work. It's why no one would have been able to but you before. And now me. Because we died, Harry guessed. In truth, he'd thought of nothing but Draco since Boxing Day, and the reason that they'd finally succeeded in making a stone hadn't been important enough to waste time on. Now he pulled it back out of his pocket and stared critically at it. Yeah, said Draco. Death is the catalyst. It's the others that we were missing. It was good that I died. Harry's brow furrowed, ring furiously to head off the burning sensation he could feel building up in his eyes again. Oh, I don't want you to die ever again. Draco rubbed his thumb along the back of Harry's hand. Now I won't have to, and neither will you. Harry exhaled in a rush. He really wasn't even sure he wanted to live forever, but there was a certain draw to it if Draco would be there too. Downstairs, the Wheezy started counting to midnight. Ten. Nine. He put the stone away and moved to lay down on the bed next to Draco. Harry curled himself around Draco's body in sight and relief when Draco's fingers came up to count through his hair. He closed his eyes and breathed in Draco's scent as the voices downstairs erupted in cheers. Mr. Weasley drunkenly began a rousing rendition of Old Lang Syne, and Harry hugged Draco tight. Whomever one was with at the stroke of midnight was supposed to be the person they were with all year. If one took a sip of elixir of life with another person, would that mean they were with that person forever? Fuck, I love you. Draco suddenly said, as if the words were too much to hold in. He made a tiny sound that he was sure he would be embarrassed about later. You too, you prick. Don't fucking die. I won't, Draco said. To be continued. Thank you for listening to this chapter of Azoth by Zeitgeistig. This is the last chapter with only the Apleg remaining. I'm looking forward to reading this to you. If you'd like to stay up to date on upcoming chapters and stories, you can follow me on YouTube, Spotify or AO3.